Hello everyone, this is an interview that we did recently with Oliver Hawkins who writes for The Analyst, uh, does amazing tactical work and I saw one of his articles recently and thought I've got to get him on to talk about it. So it's basically about different types of styles in the Premier League right down to League 2, different tactical concepts, different tactical trends, where they fit and which league and there's a few surprises in there as the goal scored possession trends all these things and i want to get them on to talk about it so we talk about the article and it's also available in the link below for you to read it as well so please have a listen and watch the interview and let me know what you think thank you ollie thanks so much for joining me today on the modern soccer coach analysis podcast first guest oh i'm so honored Gary, thanks so much. <laughs> Looking forward to getting into some uh, some, some team style comparisons. Yeah, yeah. The, your article of, I told you before we start recording, absolutely brilliant, fascinating piece. How did you come across that topic, and then how long did it take to write it? It's a very embarrassing answer to, to that first question, really, uh, Gary. The um, so I I play football personally, not very well. I play amateur football on Saturdays with my old some some old school friends. Um, I play centre half, and to say I've got a slow turning circle is, you know, would be kind to me. Um, I'm a slow defender, uh, and often get caught with a kind of a long ball over the top for a, for a fast striker, again and again and again. And I was like, wow, this is a really effective way of playing against me and against my my defence. So it almost started from there. It's like, okay, so that in this game is a very effective way of of the opposition um, launching attacks is going direct and over. The, this very slow centre half, <laughs> um, and so that got me thinking. Okay, how 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 do teams um, kind of as as we go up the up, up the grassroots level, you know, from you know, my level all the way through up to the Premier League, how do the the teams team styles differ, and how did how do teams I suppose um, change their approach to kind of generate chances? Because you know, if you were just going to go long, 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 long in the Premier League. You know, that's not really a, a way to kind of guarantee success, particularly with, you know, the, the just, I suppose, the, the modern day um, tens half is, you know, they're fast, strong, athletic, um, all the things I am not. Um, so that's really how it started. And then just kind of got into the, the, the data, um, spent about a day putting it all together, trying to look at different parts of the game. So looking at sort of in possession, defensively, um, and all sorts of things. Um, and then... Yeah, thankfully, it was a very clear story with the the data um, and could write you know, quite easily around around that. It was quite a, a nice story. Um, and yeah, it was it was a very interesting um, kind of thought thought piece that kind of went 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 through. Um, and yeah, some of the findings were, were pretty interesting, I, I thought anyway. Very interesting. We'll point everyone to the analyst article. And- <laughs> I recommend we'll put the link below and we'll recommend everyone read it but the first thing i want to look at is style comparisons looking at this here and again slow and intricate when i see slow and intricate and premier league written beside it then i think there's no way the premier league is slow but that's basically what you're talking about is the the verticality in the play yeah perhaps slow is a bit of a harsh harsh phrase maybe maybe it should be patient <laughs> patient mm. and intricate um so yeah, I mean, we, we we do see that on average, the Premier League has more passes per per sequence, um, and sequences here just mean a, uh, a period of play belonging to one team. So we have the ball at the back of, at, the, at the back. Um, we make five passes and then we lose the ball. That was one sequence there of five passes. So um, that that's how we we define that. Um, and and generally speaking, as you kind of progress down the English py- pyramids, the number of passes per sequence decreases. Um, so you've, you've you've got super teams like Manchester City, Liverpool, who keep the ball for a long time, a lot of passes, and that tends to kind of drop down as you go down um, the the leagues. On the um, on the y axis, we have a, a, another metric called direct speed, and um, that's just simply um, how far how fast the ball moves up the field meters per second. Um, and and again, generally, this is, a, this is obviously not true for every single team in every single league. But generally speaking, um, it, League Two is more direct than League One, than Championship, than Premier League. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of why we have this fast and direct quadrant, I suppose, where you see 
some of the um the lower tiers um versus the kind of slow intricate which is more of the i suppose the the elite the elite tier um and this is a um, data from the last three um seasons so so you're getting that data based off of looking at every team and seeing what they well basically you would chart get an average for premier league teams doing that yeah 100 percent. yeah and and exactly and i think it's important to say that obviously in the premier league itself there are like if you if you had this graph in the premier league you'd have teams in all, all over the place mm-hmm. so you have you know city liverpool would be definitely slow intricate bottom right quadrant but you have the likes of, of burnley aston villa watford would be in the fast and direct style um so there are differences in the league itself that, that's, that's important to note we have different styles within each each league uh, but this is the average of, of all teams across all leagues. So I suppose like if you were to, to generalise, you, you could say Premier League is more often in the kind of slow integral quad- quadrant. Yeah. So you, I want to point out to all the listeners, you do state in your article uh, that there's no right way to play football, but there is definitely an effective way. And this is something that I'm really interested because when you're talking about your pathway and the right in the article you're saying like all right well you know i was a, a you know center half but you just can't knock it long in the in the premier league and you know the virgils can still deal with that and harry Maguire's yeah. even could be going <laughs> all day but yeah the other way around and going like all right so i'm a i'm a continental coach or arriving at league two um how hard is it in your opinion to like you know with this data and just the nature of the league, take away philosophy, the nature of the league, how difficult do you think it is to swim upstream and, and play a possession-based game slower? Yeah, it's it depends um, on, I think, on, on a lot of things. I think probably first of all, it depends on, on kind of what your squad makeup is right, right, right now. Um, and obviously, unless you're kind of a very wealthy team, you can't simply just replace players you know, like like that. Um, I'm thinking to obviously when when Pep Guardiola joined City, he replaced Joe Hart with Claudio Bravo for a more sort of passing based goalkeeper. You can't really do that, uh, like and like unless you're you're a very very wealthy club. So you have to work under more constraints. And I think it really depends on, I suppose, a few things. You, you need the whole club to buy into a a, a passing ethos, passing ethos, um, which is not always easy because often the kind of playing a, a more progressive possession based style takes longer to implement and you know that during that period of trying to coach those into into your players you might not win all, all your games so in a kind of you know a very results based um league or, or uh position you might not really be afforded the time to to, to to kind of get that right um and sometimes it is it is best and you, and you do just want to get results and often you know that can come with playing slightly less pretty but more you know pragmatic effective football um, which might be more long and, 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 and more direct um i think also in you know lower leagues that there, there are more matches so you know ergo less time on the kind of training pitch to try and implement a kind of more yeah pro- progressive approach but it, it's been done um M- mk dons um have shown it's possible um that they, they play you know uh, very much ball on the ground passing um along the back and keeping the ball and progressing up through through the thirds um with the ball on, on the grounds um right russell martin obviously worked there and is now at swansea city and swansea are doing the, the exact um same thing playing a, a very progressive style of football so it it's doable for sure um, but you need to have buy-in from the board to give coaches the time to almost go through those maybe the, those those first first few bad results or you, you know you're not winning you're not getting the results you need um but with a kind of a, like a long-term vision that everyone's sort of bought into this is how we we will play um so yeah without the money you go maybe you got to go through a few teething pains first i don't know if you remember the big ron the manager show that he did with the steve yeah. Lee. Yeah. i always remember the training where he was like it was all possession based and then on the saturday it was knock it knock it <laughs> you've got to be brave you, yeah. you have to be to, to, to be brave to um you know when it actually matters when the results are on the line so to play the way you believe in and the way you train to play um and i think 
you know, that's you know that's that's worth saying that you have to be very courageous in in your beliefs sequence time another really interesting one and and for anyone that's listening to this here um without the without the data in front of it you had premier league sequence time of 9.1 which was the top league two is 6.0 explain to us what the 9.1 is and the 6.0 is yeah so again we're talking about sequences here um and that's simply um a measure of, of how long on average a team in that league keeps the ball so if you were to start a, st a stop clock when we win the ball back uh, say we're in the, in the premier league and you were to time us until we lose it that would be 9.1 seconds on, on average um and if you were in in league two that would be six seconds and you know we see that time progressively get get lower as you go down the the, the, the tiers um so so yeah maybe you could say that's you know that's a uh league one and, and league two you know being be fairly maybe uncomfortable in possession or kind of wanted to, wanted to kind of go direct and go and go long um faster and kind of mm. less keen to kind of have, have the ball at the back um i think also it is worth saying that with the premier league data you've certainly got super teams you know you've you've got two amazing teams and probably six seven others who probably push that data up a little bit they skew it higher because they are so dominant they monopolize the ball they have all the possession i mean i think from when i last checked uh, the earlier in the week um in the premier league man city's average time was 15 seconds so they're you know they're a lot higher than the average of the league itself um but yes again generally speaking you're watching a premier league match each team's gonna each team will have the ball for a longer period of time before they lose it than than in the other leagues other, other tiers that's interesting from a from a viewpoint from coaches where we would immediately when i read that you know i kind of sk i skim through articles and and try and read them as quick as possible I'll probably miss a lot no thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i go back and realize yeah that, and stuff catches me this call <laughs> because it's like it's the time because immediately i thought it was 9.1 passes but as coaches we hmm. never you never really use that context of time in possession is that something that you think coaches should be looking a little bit more at or is that growing in the game or as you always use sequences this is a it's a relatively new metric that that we've um that we've that we've launched um so i mean for, for me I, I looked at it because I, I i suppose there's a world where you could be passing the ball so say say we had um i don't know say, say your keeper has the ball at, at his feet and waits there for ages before he gets closed down and then boots it long that's so I think you can't just look at either time or passes best weekends you have to look at both of them in, in combination yeah. um because you, you could be playing really really fast direct football and keeping the ball making a very kind of uh, nice flowing fast-paced move so making a lot of passes play your sequence but actually you could have taken you know three seconds to to do that so I think the combination of those two metrics in terms of time plus passes and the results showing the way that they did meant you had a bit more of a clear picture of okay the premier league is more patient um and is less vertical versus uh, a league one or a league two which is certainly both in terms of how long a team has the ball but also how many passes that they, they complete before they lose it um there is a very clear picture uh at least for me that i try to kind of paint in the in the intro to this this piece Hello coaches, thank you so much for listening to the interview and supporting the work here at Modern Soccer Coach. Listen, it's the summertime, it's a good chance for development. Some people have a few weeks off, it's a good chance to take in a few webinars or do some learning or get a book. And if you do have an opportunity to do that in the next few weeks, please consider supporting the work we do here at Modern Soccer Coach. At the Modern Soccer Coach store, we've got webinars, we've got books, we've just released the new book, Modern Soccer Coach Detail. How does everything put together? We're talking about analysis in this interview and how do you connect it with training? How do you connect it with game models? How do you connect it with psychology, leadership? All these things, we talk about that during the book. So hopefully this is a good chance in the summer, yeah, to take a step back and do some learning, do some reading. It's also a good chance if you want to support the work we do here at Modern Soccer Coach, we do our best to keep everything free for as much as we can. So modernsoccercoach.com slash shop. Please check it out. Thanks for the support. 
pass accuracy numbers again uh, for people that that are listening to this here and, and don't have the graphic. This jumped out at me in terms of the difference between Premier League and League Two, and obviously, like I'm thinking professional leagues. There's a difference between Premier League and League Two, but like fifteen percent, I, I think that's massive. So then I'm I'm reading it, going like, all right, well, what do you think? Is that because of the technical? Because without reading this article, I would have said, yeah, better players. Mm-hmm. But then when you read the article, it it moves you into looking at styles. So now you're thinking, all right, well then, what's it? What's the main cause? And I, I've written in the question: Is it chicken or egg? Like, is there a is one driving the other, or what's your thoughts on that? Honestly, this this question was a really good question uh, and and really difficult, and we could probably spend an hour more talking about literally this this one this one question because there's so many ways you, you could go with it. Um, one thing that, that really sprung sprung to mind um, for me was actually um, so Nick, Nicky Mellon, who's the head coach of Tranmere Rovers, who are in, in League Two, he spoke. He spoke at um, a Sats Perform Pro Forum event uh, earlier in in the year, and he was asked the question along the lines of something like, "How do you coach players who aren't at the, the, the elite level? So they aren't Premier League level. They're good, but they aren't the elite, the, the, the elite level." And his immediate response to the question was, "They are elite. I see them, and they see themselves as technically." Okay, maybe not quite as good as the top top players in in the country, but pretty close. Um, so I think if if you asked him, he he'd say this is definitely a, a styles based um, result. You know, it's not because my players can't pass the ball; <laughs> it's it's because for we 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 choose to you know probably play longer, play more direct. Which obviously, that's why you, you you might see the lower pass accuracy because it's, it's obviously hard to complete a pass that's going further than you know sideways to your fellow centre half or or fullback. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think we shouldn't overestimate the sorry underestimate the influence of foreign coaching in the Premier League. Uh, I think you know the we've seen an influx of, of coaches come from the continent to, to coach in, in, in the top flights over the last five, six years or so. And, and those guys do bring with them definite styles of play. You know, we, we, we want to play um, with the ball on, on, on the floor. We want to play progressive football. Um, so maybe that's got to do a little bit with the stylistic differences here. And maybe if you wanted to kind of do a broad brush statement, you could say, okay, maybe the English managers low down the league, play a more pragmatic direct style of, of of football which obviously kind of shows in this pass accuracy um, numbers here um so for me I, if i had to answer the question I, I would say it's more to do with with the style because i i struggle to believe that you know league two players are still phenomenal players um they're still exceptionally you know, gifted um and you know would run rings around any amateur football player maybe the best player on the pitch by absolute country mile so i refuse to believe that that they're that much worse in in uh, quotation marks than like a top level player so you know i think it's it's a combination of the two but i if i had to kind of answer the question i'd come down on the i think it's because people are generally speaking playing a little bit more direct um and they're playing longer passes which is why that number is is lower i've actually just i've just broke down a game this morning there was a cup game um and it was 100 miles an hour mm. transitional how much do you think like emotion or even weather plays an impact on things like this here yeah i think emotion is a, is a really good point um i'm not sure if you've seen it but there's a really good video doing the rounds on on, on twitter of scott parker giving his halftime bournemouth team talk player. um to his bournemouth players i think in the knots forest game that saw them go get promoted um uh, it's nearly a half time and his massive message was it's you it's you're, you're playing too emotionally it's too basketball style attack to, uh, attack 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 and it's it's too crazy and too chaotic and they were basically he basically was saying we want to control this game we want to we, we, we want to take the emotional angst out of the game and control it on, on, on our terms so you can definitely get caught in the kind of skelter end to end we attack you attack um 
game if you're not too careful. Um, and you think of the kind of you know, maybe some of the the ways that Pep Guardiola City have been caught into that battle in in kind of um, European Cup competitions in in recent memory, where they kind of get sucked into a crazy transitional game rather than you know how he wants to control a game you know with with basically possession and, and positional play. It can definitely happen, and it can happen to the to the best teams. Um, I think weather wise, it's a really it, another interesting point. Um, and actually, I actually looked looked up some some numbers for I suppose tr traditional, I guess culturally more passing based countries. So Spain and, and Brazil were kind of two that I, I looked at. And so this the Spanish segunda, so this the second tier in Spain, um, have a seventy seven passing accuracy over the last three seasons. So that's about championship level, a little bit more. Um, and Brazilian Serie B is up at seventy nine percent. So that's almost Premier League level. So the kind of question around cultural um, approaches is really interesting because I, I I think that that maybe points to the fact that actually culturally in you know South America or, or Spain there is a more of a, a possession based keep the ball based approach than maybe there is in, in in England and that might be because it's probably because of the national teams and and the culture kind of growing up kind of through grassroots but also pitches wise I mean in England we have I think pretty good pitches, all things being equal, but actually over the winter, um, some of them are quite open to the elements. Wind, rain can kind of um, you know affect the pitch, and that you know, that, that that might if you can if you sort of combine that with maybe a, a technical, maybe a, a lack of technical ability in some teams um, in the kind of low, lower pyramid, then that could kind of culminate in a yeah a lower passing accuracy. I, I, I'd, I'd say. Again, in the article, you point out that there's always exceptions to the rule. The Analyst had a great article. I'll talk to you before we start recording. Leicester City, when they won the league in 2016, I'll just go through real quick, 42.6% possession, under, underperformed expected goals, league's second lowest percentage of passes completed. But then it balances out with like, well, I don't know if balance is the right word, but their defensive metrics were so good so in terms of getting this right do you think from a from a data perspective do you think that balancing uh offensive and defensive metrics are really really crucial yeah w without a doubt i mean in a perfect world you have you know you have great metrics in both yeah. um so you have a super team who's able to generate you know, great chances but also keep it super tight at the back um and we've seen that with you know Manchester City over the past three four seasons, you know they have basically been the best in terms of um, XG going forward, but also kind of XG against as well. They've been kind of leading in both categories, and it's why they've been so dominant. Um, that Leicester team, it's funny. I mean, I think there's a there's a reason why they were such a long shot to win. Um, and I think if you took teams and you and you played like Leicester played with their data and their numbers, you don't usually win leagues. Um, so I think they were certainly an, an outlier. Um, but what's key about that Leicester team is that they had, you know, despite them playing without the ball for so long um, and kind of relying on, you know, Wes, Wes Morgan and Robert Huth, they're back to kind of clear a lot of crosses, a lot of a lot of head, um, aerial work from them. They were really tight at the back. But they balanced that with, they had the second highest XG in the entire league last year. So they were creating the second highest quality of chances out of all teams. So it's not like they were doing nothing going forwards. Um, and that's because they had, you know, a, a huge threat on the counter with, you know, Vardy and, and Mares who were electric in transition. You can, they, 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 they could literally sit back, soak up, soak up the pressure and then release those superstar players, those lightning quick players on the break and, and catch teams, you know, literally, literally in, in transition. Um, also helped that they had Kante as well playing in playing in midfield, playing about five positions himself, running around and kind of an awesome screen in front of them. Um, but they were, I mean, they 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 trailed in a lot of those matches, um, and and simply just with the confidence that if we sit back and we absorb these crosses, we have got a great back four and, and, and a keeper, and we release you know Vardy and, and Mares to kind of go and do their thing. That's how we're gonna we're gonna kind of counter attack um, that way and. Yeah, I, mean, I think if you were to run the season again, run it back, would they win it again? Arguably not, but um, 
that's a beautiful thing about about it yeah god again that could be another podcast episode we should get you back on talk about Leicester city because that's like from a data perspective is fascinating um yeah it's a great it's a great uh use case yeah um back to back to the article the the goal scored picture um which i'll pull up here i could again couldn't believe this <laughs> there's more goals scored in the premier league than any other of the divisions but i'm thinking again should this not be the other way around should there not be more chess matches should there not be more standoffs would did that surprise you i mean i suppose you could say you could say yes i mean that there's sort of better better defenses more pressure on strikers um you know more tactical minds doing battle but at the same time better strikers i suppose is is a natural response you know you've got better players trying to put the ball into the back of the net um and you've also got you know pretty pretty wild you know records being set by kind of free scoring teams which which would pull, pull up the average of, of 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 course um i think for me the the biggest difference between the the premier league versus the other leagues in terms of the goals scored and, and maybe why that was the case was shot location so in in the top tier players take shots from closer closer to the to the goal uh, on, on average speaking so i think um, comparing the average shot location in the Premier League to the League Two, there's a one meter difference in terms of how close to the goal that shot was taken. Doesn't sound like a lot, but um, I think actually it is on a on a kind of a, a football pitch. Um, and also, a high proportion of shot, shots were taken from inside, inside the box in the, in the Premier League as, as well. So players are shooting in better locations, um, which makes it easier to score. So whether or not that's the influence of analytics on the, on the game, like XG tells us that, you know, shoot from closest to the goal, shoot from more centrally, and you've got a better chance of, of, of scoring. Um, I don't know. Probably is a bit of uh, a bit of that as kind of, you know, more and more teams now employ analysts and, and have, you know, bespoke analyst teams to kind of work on on, the, on these sort of things. Um, and, and also to kind of go into a, onto a second point, they also take fewer headed shots the higher up the leagues that, that, that you go and, and headers are, are hard to score from because you've you know it's harder to score header than it's kind of score um with, with the ball along 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 the floor so i think kind of like a, a combination of probably slightly better finishes um but taking you know more better shots shots that are closer to, to, to the goal and when the ball's, ball's on the ground probably come com, uh, combines to making kind of a, a more con conducive score score friendly um type environment yeah well that, that makes sense then because more headed efforts means more crosses whereas the premier league player has the like i i completely agree the shot map is sometimes is over simplification of coaching because you look at a shot map and say all right we'll get close to the goal finish the real challenge is how to access that space mm -hmm. whereas a premier league player because they play and like it is so they're so specific with positioning and what they can do they can access those areas whereas a lower league player might they might be chucking at diagonal balls earlier yeah and i think we've also seen the rise of like the inverted winger slash the inside forward who who is targeting a kind of runs in but in behind trying to get to the byline and then cut the ball back um and actually those opportunities are really high value in terms of if you want to score a goal get a player to go to the byline kind of back in and you just basically walk onto it and, and tap it in uh in in theory um and, and we do see there are more of those pullback passes in the premier league versus the other, other three tiers um so you know that also helps things i mean i think yeah i mean to, to your point exactly we 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 we, we, we do also see you know, very I think more of a you know maybe an attack versus defense sort of build up and, and phase of play in, in the Premier League where you've got the ball on the edge of the box with maybe a like a, a low block trying to oppose you and you've got to try and work your work your way through that block to kind of get to a, to a good shooting opportunity um whereas potentially in in slightly lower leagues maybe you almost you miss out that phase of, of build up close to the, to the opposition box because it's a, likely, a little bit, bit bit more direct so you're going a bit longer and playing off a, a strike and then kind of linking up through 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 him 
the last picture uh, is the ball and play metric. Uh, again, uh, yeah. really, really interesting. It kind of brings us to. I, mean, I saw the clip this morning. You probably saw it on social media with a Chelsea guy looking for the ball back. Yeah. And is there anything metric that the balls have played uh, longer that there's ball kids are better? <laughs> to be I, fair, we, we, we don't collect data on ball kids. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, that it's definitely no secret that um, you know, ball, ball kids are trained and instructed by coaches to to you know be fast or, or be slow mm. um i think you know ahead of the, the city atletico uh, game in, in the champions leagues um that quarter final i think it was um pep guardiola gave a presentation to his, to his ball kids who were from the under 14 and under 13 uh, uh squad and, and told them look you're very important in our tactics for, for tonight you have to be fast we lose the ball you give it up straight away we don't want to um yeah to, to, to waste time basically um but it's funny you should bring up this this point because in in city's game against real madrid in, in that kind of crazy second leg of, of of that champions league semi-final where you know they almost were winning and then they kind of got sent extra, extra time um in the second half of that extra, extra time period the ball was in play for just over seven minutes of 18 minutes total allotted which is 40 percent of total time so 60 percent of the time there was no football being played, which was either a masterclass from from, from Real Madrid, um, a bit of maybe a, a bit of um, naivety from City or, or, or on their behalf, um, and perhaps a bit of a, a refereeing um, blunder, not adding on the right the right time. But you know that was a, a really stark example of just how to kill a game. You know, I think there was a, a double injury where you had Vinicius Junior and Militao both went down at the same time, injured cramp or maybe a, a groin strain honestly i i timed it from them going down to the, to the turf to the ball being back in play it was three minutes um so i mean that's a very extreme example of, of a team trying to kill the clock um but even even in as, as you say in normal maps where there's you know we're, we're not in such a hyper um intense hyper competitive you know small time scale scenario a, a general match you know you you see I mean, the Premier League's in play for just shy of 55 minutes. So, you know, you, you, if you get to, if you get to watch a game, you don't even see an hour worth of football, um, and that does decrease as well as we go down the English pyramid. Um, and that's because the ball the ball's out of play for for for, for a lot more time in League One and, and League Two um, because because the, the the style of play is a little bit longer, uh, more passes are over hit or headed out of play or, or lost. Um, there, there are more throw-ins as a result, and that time, you know, adds up basically. Um, but I mean, even even so, it, 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 I think maybe, maybe if you showed that those figures to you know a, a fee-paying match goer, they might be like, oh, interesting. Maybe I do support the um, you know the stopping the clock proposals that are coming in potentially. Well, then, then let's go there. Then, what what's your thoughts on that? As a you know, from a data perspective and from a fan. Yeah, um, I, I think, I think like 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 football generally, things are so tribal. I mean, you, I think if your team is leading, you love being able to take the ball into the corner and you know eat the clock, waste time. You love it if your if your team's doing that. Um, whereas if you, whereas if it's been done against you, you hate it and you think it's the worst thing ever, and you you know you you, yeah, you kind of revile against it. Um, so I think it, it kind of depends on. I guess is it your team that's 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 uh, being involved in here? But I think if you look at it, you know, dispassionately, and you look at it um, objectively, I'm personally very keen to see um, how trials of, of that would, would, would work. Um, they're trialing it in in Portugal um, over the summer in the under twenty three Revelation Cup. So very interested to see what happens as a result. Um, I don't think. I'm trying to think how how it will change the, the game, and I, and I think obviously the, the beauty of football is that it's so fluid and so dynamic. Um, but I don't think this would change that too much. Um, if anything, maybe, maybe it would encourage people to kind of get the ball back into play faster. I, I don't know to kind of keep the the speed of the game um, speed of the game going. Um, it will certainly you know, prevent a lot of people players feigning injury because um, uh, that would basically be rendered point pointless um, at, at this stage. Um, 
So yeah, I'm very intrigued. I think if the trials go go well in in Portugal and it doesn't change the game too much, other than you know the um, all the bad stuff that we, we kind of want to get rid of, then I'd be all for it. I mean, it would it would ruin a lot of our historical database collection because you know you'd you'd have um, you know you would lose you'd for, you'd forever lose the you know 90th minute winner wouldn't yeah. exist anymore i mean 60th minute winner <laughs> so it would ru ruin all of our historical data that we've collected over the past you know 30 30 40 years because all those those goal scoring times would all be totally out of whack so selfishly maybe i should be campaigning for for no change uh, <laughs> keep it as it is so we can compare apples with apples, with apples. <laughs> i was in um so in, in america they in college they they put the clock down mm -hmm. so they keep it running and then you know it doesn't stop but when the ball goes out but then all of a sudden you know the referee if there's a stoppage the referee does the same and the clock stops uh, it's not great um but i'll tell you what's great is the last 10 seconds of the game is like you just see people like you could be in complete control but the amount of teams that concede in buzzer beater style mm -hmm. is just because of the nature of pressure it's it's really really fun i would I would love to just to see that there from a from a curiosity perspective but i also think that yeah i i think it would be a great great thing i i it, it time wasting is a big problem i think it and not even at the professional level like just even at amateur level i think it's starting to creep in i think the issue is it's not punished harshly enough mm. i mean that would be one way to so i suppose try and fix it without going as far as having a stop clock it's just punished punish it more, more heavily um but that is subjective you know is a player really injured or, or or not only they probably know um really um i mean i i'm with you i i love the when the clock goes red in rugby and this is, this is the last chance you have a scoring you and you can kind of go down the pitch and try and score and try and score and then uh happens or doesn't happen i love that sort of climactic build up um and that sort of the the finish that that creates is is great viewing um so i mean yeah i i would I'd be I would be on board of it. Mm. All right, last couple, um, and we'll finish up with uh, with like as an analyst role. Let's say you know you go into uh, a League Two team as a full time analyst tomorrow morning with all this information. You sit down with a head coach, and they're like, "All right, where do I prioritize my game model with data?" Yeah. Um... I think the first thing that I would say is practice your throw-ins <laughs> because there there are there are so many more throw-ins in, in League Two than there are in any other league in kind of like the the top four in England. So that there's like 60 throw-ins per per League Two match, uh, only 40 in the Premier League. So you've got to throw in almost like you know what's that um, bad maths, but over like one every minute and a half. Um, so practice your throw-ins. Um, can you devise routines from from those throw-ins? We've seen Brentford do it to great effect. In the Premier League this this year, um, almost treating them like a set piece. We we can control, um, we can con control the ball. It's, it's static. We can, can control our players' runs. Um, so can we devise routines to you know a keep the ball from throw-ins because that's you know odd, oddly oddly enough, um, generally speaking, teams don't really retain the ball from throw-ins. Like it's, it's it's quite hard to and unless you've kind of well worked and practice at it, it's hard to retain the ball. So how do we a keep the ball from these situations and then b i suppose how do we devise almost set piece routines to kind of fashion chances from from them um because there are so many so many more in, in league two um i think beyond that i think we mentioned it before but i think shooting habits is, is worthwhile looking at um you're trying to trying to work the ball closer to towards goal before letting fly um you know i, I think maybe you know encouraging midfield players to think twice about having a go from 25 30 yards out if if, it's, if there's nothing else on try and work, work the angles try and maybe get get a cross in or, or kind of get, try and get behind the opposition back back line um but i think what is very important to, to appreciate is that football is obviously is, is a you know it's a game of game theory it depends on what your what your opposition is doing so making sure that you analyze it at the opposition's team playing style how they set up how they generate chances you know if you were to kind of plot that that league style comparison matrix for for just your league okay did this team play 
fast and direct? Are they slow and intricate? Where do they stand on that sort of that matrix? Um, and then devise ways to kind of counter counter that while trying to play to your strengths, I, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of what, what I try and do three things. And then I suppose talk to the, the, the players, talk to the manager and see if they have a gut feel for anything else that they, um, they think is happening on the pitch and then try and look into the numbers beneath that, I suppose. Brilliant. Brilliant. And then the last one would be then if you're, if you're in a club that doesn't have data and it doesn't have Opta and you're a, you know, an ambitious semi-pro team or whatever it is, college team, and what would you advise for data collection and, and how would you advise that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I probably would go down the, the video route. Um, you can, I think you can buy fairly affordable sort of wide, wide angle um, video capture sort of software, have that one up high, high angle and try and get most of the pitch pitch in it um, and, and, and record your games and, and basically try and do the data collection post-match rather than doing it in real time. It's very, very challenging. Um, assuming it's, it's it's a coach or two players or like, like on their own doing the, the post-match data collection, I probably wouldn't overdo it in terms of looking at player actions because that suddenly is taking you so much time to kind of go through and look at you know, player passing and, and, and that sort of thing. So I'd focus more on the team as, as a whole. Um, you know, where do we get the most joy in attack? Where do we lose the ball? Where do we look vulnerable? Um, do we have good runs? You know, in 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 our in both boxes for doing set pieces. How how is our shape? I probably would go more um, more broad, at, at, at kind of like at the start, looking at general patterns and general trends, rather than looking at okay, how did my left back do in terms of his you know his progressive passing? Because um, that's so such a time sink. Um, and then probably to 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 finish here. I think what's important is that we then communicate that with our players. So, you know, making sure that the players are aware of, of quantifiable targets that we have, you know, maybe we do lose the ball too much in, in our own, in our own half. Okay. As a team, we want to make sure we, we want to halve that, that figure by the end of the season, for example, um, we want to block crosses. So fullbacks get out wide, block crosses, um, but put a number on that you know, tell, tell, the team, maybe the the back four and, and midfield pivot. Okay, we're, 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 this is what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to limit turnovers in, in our own half. Put a number on that um, because you know, having quantifiable targets means you can push players to, to try and aim towards those targets. Um, and obviously, if you can combine individual improvements, that obviously leads as a whole to the team getting better in, in certain areas. So, I think um, yeah, I wouldn't go overboard. Don't. Don't think that that, that that you know you need to click everything on the pitch. That thing at once is it's, it's crazy and, and it's probably going to make a head explode. Um, don't think that data will solve everything because you can use it to, to improve marginal gains, but it's not going to be the, the the be all and end all. Um, it's going to you know help your chances of, of winning if you can do it properly, but it's not going to guarantee uh, a win. And um, yeah, I think get get, get players to, to to buy into it as well because that's you know, they're going to want to know. Um, you know, oh, coach, did I um, did I beat my target the, this match? Did I block crosses? Did I you know, keep keep the ball in 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 in, in an hour and a half? That sort of thing, I think, um, it makes people kind of play play up and play better. Fantastic, Oliver, top class. I've loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great to go through it. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Keep up the great work. Um, what articles next? Oh, it's a good question. Um. I did one recently on, on Arsenal's corner routines, which, which, which went down quite quite well, quite well. They've got a nice uh, a nice nice routine going down there, so um, that was that was a good one. Uh, I think uh, maybe look at the Championship playoff final, which will be in uh, a week or so here at the time of the recording. Maybe looking at um, looking at that, um, or maybe even maybe Wickham. Wickham Wanderers, obviously. I mean, they are the definition of. There's no right, right way to play football. You know, they they rank bottom of of, of, of League One for a lot of these metrics. Um, pass completion rate, short passing, they're at the bottom. Yet yeah, they're in the final of the playoff, uh, League One playoff final against, you know, arguably a, a more progressive team. So you, you can do it if you, you know, put your mind to it. You, you can play however you want and there's no right way of playing. <laughs> Brilliant. It gives us all hope. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Maybe one day I can play in uh, the Premier League by a lack of pace. <laughs> 